right, so academic writers, I'm Black. That's me. Presents Ignite Your Summer 2024 Writing. It's a free coaching call for if you know. For those of you, I know a lot of people are are, are new and joining. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Dr. Shalom Shachaf. My PhD is in uh, Global Media Studies uh, from the Radio Television Film Department at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, I do academic writing and creativity coaching, consultancy, um, also developmental uh, editing. Uh, I have a little bit of a different take about the development. I, I'm happy to answer questions about that later. Some of you, Susan can tell you, you know, we've been working on this for a while. Um, my approach is, you know, I have two rates. I read your shit and I don't read your shit, basically. <laughs> when I read your shit, and excuse my French, right? And I, it's, it's a higher ticket, but I really get in there and I'm like, boom, this is what needs to happen. You always feel like ready to go, write the thing after working with me. But uh, again, all of this is just an introduction. Uh, you guys are watching this on Academic Writers and Block, many of you. Uh, so you are familiar with our beautiful community for academic writers. I do online and campus workshop. And I specialize in helping academic writers thrive by overcoming their um, the writer's block. So let me start this today. Today I'm starting with sharing with you the results of two recent surveys uh, I did on the community. And that helped me also construct um, today's uh, coaching call and, and um, the summer programs. So here's what's going on. We had one poll that was asking people about their summer, summer plans. So you know, people can answer several questions and I am not a quantitative person. So, you know, if the percentage doesn't add up, that's the reason because many people, you know, answer more than one. But generally speaking, it gives us a, a picture of what people were dealing with. So 28% of you said you were working on multiple projects and each of them is in a different stage. 26% uh, of you said that you want to push a project to completion. 14% said you want to start a new project. 12% said that you got to rest and recharge because this year was crazy. And 10% said they're working specifically on journal article writing. Uh, then 4 more percent said they want to resolve their writer's block. Uh, there were a couple of more one percenters, but that, that, was, that was the bulk. All right. And then the second survey was, what are your challenges and what do you need? So I asked people what they, and, you know, I gave some pre-constituted. Now, this was a very telling result. 25%, uh, which I think ended up being like 60 or 80 votes, I don't remember, said that they need burnout recovery. Now, I know we have been facing a burnout epidemic, epidemic, generally speaking, but I think more so in academia, it started, I mean, we went into 2020, we went into COVID already burnt out. Then, you know, we all had to shift everything we were doing and, you know, teach remotely while also being our, our kids' least favorite teacher and, and cook, right, in the home. It was just so much, but I don't really see academia and academics and my clients catching up as much. And I will tell you, I have clients, um, I have a coaching business that, that that's kind of pitched to a wider um, audience I really see the academic struggling more is all I'm going to say. Like in my experience, what I see that like the more years you're in academia, the more this burnout is just becoming, um, you know, dangerous. All right. 24% said they must resolve their writer's block. Now, I thought that was really interesting because it was a lot of the same people answering both. And when I asked people what are their plans, the, the writer's block was the last at 4%. Oh, yeah. I'll work on multiple projects, but what about that writer's block? Resolving it would help you with your main goal, right? So I, are you seeing the problem? So when I ask people like, what are your challenges? You're burnt out, they're blocked, but then you know they have these challenges, but then they wanna jump into accomplishing the goals. Introducing an intervention for me. <laughs> I really do believe and I know uh, and I saw for a fact that when you work on the burnout recovery on the and on proven gentle self-compassionate methods to resolve your writer's block, then working on your multiple projects on different stages is going to be a lot easier. All right, 21% said you need to learn better scheduling practices. How do you plan a project? How do you 
manage your many demands on your time. A lot of things went into that, um, you know, conflicting demands, parenting demands, uh, taking care of uh, students, etc. And 60% said planning, uh, setting goals with uh, vision and clarity, getting very clear about your purpose and your vision. Um, and 11% struggle with motivation. So actually today, what I decided to uh, to workshop with you is this motivation puzzle. I'm going to try to get to it uh, quite quickly so that we can do that because I really think I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, just say this. In social sciences, in psychology, sociology, brain sciences also, right? We've known since the 1950s that the model of incentivizing through sticks and carrots, right, reward or punishment is actually failing anybody who's trying to achieve a creative goal. If your goal is creative, if it's stuffing envelopes, right, and I'm kind of jumping ahead to that, right, if it's something mechanical, yeah, give people a reward if they do it faster, you know, if there are preset series of steps that people have to do and they don't have to think about it, that reward punishment model works. But when it's trying to incentivize what you're actually trying to do as an academic writer, which I will distill it to, you have a voice and you feel the burning I will say motivation, right? You you have this conviction that you need to raise your voice, that you want to contribute. That's what you want to make a contribution, and it's a creative contribution. Then that um, stick and carrot. I will punish myself. I will discipline myself. This this I'm giving you the the the, the bottom line. This is why you struggle with motivation. You don't struggle with motivation. You struggle with a wrong model of self incentivization. Does that make sense? All right, so this is where I'm going to try to intervene in the mini workshop that I created for you today. And it's all kind of science-based, et, et cetera. Uh, but before we get to this, let me continue to share this. So take a, just as, again, a screenshot, if you will, of these survey results, right? You have a, a bunch of people in our community that are burnt out. Burnout is beyond exhaustion, burnt out is done, tax, body, mind, spirit, you gave it everything you had and there's no more to give, right? And that they, you know, and people who feel blocked that they have to resolve the writer's block and yet they wanna somehow make a plan for the summer where they work on multiple projects at the same time, push projects to completion, start new project, right? And only at 12% do we get to rest and recharge. So we're going to try to intervene in what needs to happen first, right? We're going to try to clarify our mindset as we navigate the transition from the teaching year. And you know, it doesn't matter if you taught or you were on leave or you don't teach, or, but the year into the summer. All right, does that make sense, everybody? And feel free to uh, you know, uh, comment in the chat, let me know what you think. And uh, I usually try not to get distracted during the presentation, but I would love to hear. All right, so. Um, I'm going to go back kind of like over the basics of my approach. Um, you know, I, I had this little essay there about academia's writing problem, but this is the basics, right? So in academia, we are constantly judged based on our writing. We know that to get promoted, to get a degree, to, to get anything, to get a new job when you're winning your job, right? It, as long as you can demonstrate that you can continue to publish, uh, the doors would continue to open, right? publish high quality, this, that, or the other, right? And constantly be judged on your writing. That's the process we have. And it's an important process, right? Our contributions are logical and logic needs more eyes to make sure that the logical pattern holds, right? So all of this, however, um, creates a lot of pressure on writing. However, universities don't train students and faculty as writers. You know, I went to a fantastic graduate program. I got fantastic training on the subject matter, on the methods, on, on any variety of things, but there was not 
I mean, there might have been a class that wasn't good. <laughs> you know, there rarely are really good process oriented classes that bring the wealth of existing information that's out there, um, existing practices that can really help develop a writing practice. Practice is noun and verb, right? Like get you practice and you have a practice. This is a major part in the work I do with clients. First of all, just advocating for them to realize you have a writing practice. It's just, it's not mindful. It's shitty. It has a lot of toxicity in the habits. You, you know, many times, right, your, your writing practice is make myself guilty, avoid, 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 and then being tried to the deadline while neglecting everybody in my life and getting a lot of anger, and that sabotages me. Yeah? Okay, I see a lot of people <laughs> nodding vigorously to that. All right, so you have a writing practice, but it's not a good writing practice. So what do we tend to fall on without mindfulness is a very shitty way of doing things. Uh, and again, I'm, not, I'm trying not to get into like the whole workshop, right? Like we go in workshop, we go into all the reasons why the default seems to kind of go right into that space. Um, and you know, it's like that one seminar paper that you wrote uh, and you waited for the last minute. And maybe because you are actually, you know, an undergraduate and you didn't have five kids and 500 jobs or whatever, um, you were able in the last minute to sit, pull an all-nighter and write a beautiful thing that got an A+. Plus. And then your brain will goes like, oh, great. That's the way you kind of confuse, um, you know, causality. Like, oh, because I waited for the deadline, the, the beautiful thing came out of me. And then you're kind of setting yourself up to do, for this. All right, so you guys get it. Um, so the fact that we're judged based on our writing, but university don't train us as writers, creates a cycle of anxiety paralysis and confusion. Um, part of the confusion, I'm gonna to stop just to, to look at everybody now. Part of the confusion, it's a really important part, is that we are not trained to be okay with the beginning stages of a creative process being confusing. We only can create uh, order through chaos, right? The only way to create an orderly product is to let things leap out of your brain, right? Like Athena from Zeus's brain. Um, but but it's not ready. It's not a product, right? Like we have all of these thoughts. It's like this yarn of thoughts, right? And we are not comfortable with not, I call it, people try to write, they try to write the last draft first, right? There is this totally delusional stereotype. And Hollywood is actually pretty good at that, right? Like showing people finishing novels and like they, they start by writing the first word, second word, like da, 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 here I am, I'm writing the last. Draft. No, your first draft needs to look like the stick figure that later through many iterations fills out with a lot of other color palettes and, and you make mistakes and you cover over. So a lot of the work I do is just teach people to hold self-compassionate, patient, space around early draft, like just the process that goes from chaos at the beginning and we only weave order out of chaos. There is no other way. So you need to become comfortable with the chaotic nature of beginnings. All right, so you guys are like, I'm, I'm throwing all my best jams at you today. Uh, I, I miss this group. I miss, I have not been here for a while. Academia, man, this year was crazy. All right. So this results in that cycle of anxiety, paralysis, and confusion. And of course, it's time for change. And what I am offering is summer 2024 writing workshop series, develop your writing uh, practice. Uh, oh, it's missing a couple of words like style, craft, et cetera. But I do want to just quickly talk to you about the series new format uh, for today. Uh, and again, those of you just joining, this is not, you know, it's a sales pitch, but it's not a sales pitch. A lot of you asked me for a summer workshop. I spend time putting together something and I got to talk with a lot of you one-on-one -on -one, and then we saw that the price wasn't working and then I came up with a, a, a way to make it more affordable. So let me explain what I did and, and quickly and then we're going to go into the full mini workshop I prepared for you today. So for both affordability and impact, I am doing the full program, uh, which is the foundational program and I'll show you the, the stuff in a minute, but it's divided into four units. So unit one is going to call is going to deal with a lot of what I was talking about right now, overcoming writer's block. So first, becoming mindful, understanding 
what is the shitty writing practice you already have because you have one, it's just not great. And then resolving your writer's block by building good habits. We also intervene because we're academics, we love the science. So the psychology and the neuroscience of writer's block. Um, in a minute, I'll talk about what you get. And Susan, you were, uh, I think you're the only one here who took the full uh, workshop. So you can, you can share later, but there's always good, short, fun readings. It's not mandatory. It's not like you now need to read like, you know, a thousand pages of post-colonial theory for my class. Um, but there's always the science uh, and uh, the interventions that I brought from other people in PDF for free included. Now, you also get a pre-recorded lesson for, uh, but in this case, it's going to be two or three pre-recorded lessons, and you get some time to work with it. And then we're going to meet for a full day live workshop for each of the units. So more on that in a minute, but all right, unit one, we overcome writer's block. Unit two refocuses on time management and planning and scheduling tools, but I call it healing your relationship with time. So let me do the pitch for a little tiny bit here. Time management can be amazing. Time management tools, a lot of us, I know if you're here, you probably worked with like a million of them. However, let me tell you this. I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen it. Our obsession with time management becomes a part of our block, right? It becomes a part of our blocked behavior, right? So what I do is I really intervene again every time. I start by intervening in the, with the unconscious, unmindful, existing mindset that you guys have around time. And then I intervene with, again, the science of all of that, how looking at time and trying to control your time and from this place of like, ah, I will control everything, just exacerbate your anxiety. We try to just like unlearn these practices and this mindset. And then I introduce really fun, useful, easy, self-compassionate timing tools. And again, I see Susan kind of like, Susan, are, are you working still with it? I have the handheld timing scheduling tool, which is basically, it's, it's, there you go. I'll show you mine for this summer. Where is it? Hang on. Ah, summer. I'm not going to show you mine. <laughs> okay. But anyways, it's kind of like a little bit of playing. Um, what is it called, Susan? Remind me again. Battleship, right? We start by first blocking out everything that is uh, pre-scheduled, you know, from your teaching time to your doctor's appointments for you and your kids. And, and I try to really get people to put, you know, when do you go to the supermarket? Everything. And then we recognize what are the open windows? But then we intervene with your time and energy needs. What is your best time? How do you advocate for yourself to get those best time? Are you the person that steps up to say, I deserve to have, right? Uh, again, quickly, I'm just trying to give you kind of the sense of it. You know, I, I often tell academics, do you accept phone calls from your sisters, moms, whatever, husband, somebody that needs you when you're teaching? And in your the mid, you're in class teaching. Do you let everybody have access to you at that time? And of course not. While you're teaching, nobody, everybody in your life knows this is not a good time to call you and ask you for shit. Why do you then agree to let people do that to you during your writing time? So working with me, we create a non-conflictual way of really making you the advocate to first recognize and then defend and claim your time around your writing. So uh, that's the time uh, workshop that's gonna be unit two. Unit three is master the academic style, hacking the structure of your research paper or book or journal article. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this too much. This is what we usually mean when we say writing, right? But as you see, I don't think we get to that until we figured out creating you know, a better uh, writing practice that's not anxious and then learning how to deal with time because time is the medium of creativity, right? We can only bring forth our creativity through time. And so unit three is that uh, a hack in the academic style. And again, this is where you're very much invited to bring your own project and we workshop it together and we hack it, we, we figure it out. <clears throat> and then unit four brings all of these pieces together around the concept of craft. I also call it finishing school because this is when we really create the momentum to finish and complete. 
um, mastering craft of writing, learn how to implement your plan from start to finish. All right, so now quickly about the schedule. What I did was cre I created, I'm just gonna put all of these, right? So I created four units. Each unit will include two or three pre-recorded lessons on the topic, readings, a private Facebook group where we workshop things together, and one day long live session. It's like five hours from 11 in the morning to 4 p.m. We might actually go longer if we take a big lunch break. Um, so this is still kind of tentative, but that's the idea. And I schedule those on Fridays. There will be a possible Sunday makeup date. So if you are ready to you know, go in and get the uh, workshop, but you really want unit two and June uh, 28th, you're traveling, don't worry. We can figure out makeup dates later. Um, in case this is not clear enough, so these are just the dates. By the way, you guys, the, the website is almost ready. I'm still working on like the, the adding the, all the discounts, uh, but this would be, I will share with you in a minute, but uh, let me show you an example. So you need one, for example, live, the live workshop would be June 14th, and it's resolving writer's block, building good habits, understanding the science behind writer's block, learn how to overcome it to establish all of this, right? And you get lessons one, two, three, and then unit two, oops, sorry, is in June 28th, it's healing your relationship. Because, so basically you can take, you can take unit one and unit two together. Let me show you the pricing options. So let, I mean, you know what, let me start at the end. If you're taking the full program, this is the best value. The early bird special is for is oops, available for 785 for all of these. Now, let's say you just want one unit, any of them. You can get them for 250 each. So you get two or three pre-recorded lessons, uh, a lot of readings, a Facebook group, all of that, and a big day-long workshop with me. Uh, and you can get it in the early bird rate if you act fast for only $235, which is really, uh, you know, should be affordable. If this is still not affordable for you, I am still willing to have a conversation about breaking up payments or whatnot. Um, right then, you can take two units. Again, these are worth 500. The early rate would be 460. So you get a discount for each additional unit, right? The, the, the third one, again, 750, but it would be available for 675, which is about 10% discount, or you can get all four units. The value is 1,000 if we base on 250 per unit, but I'm already offering it for the discounted 850 with the early bird rate of 785. So again, I know this is a lot of money information. Nobody likes that. But this is what I kind of figured out as a way to, you know, instead of just doing one program that's a thousand dollars and, you know, either you can take it or, you know, there's no solution for you, you can either get all of the program. And I also actually really like for summer, the structure of you guys are self-paced, you're working for each unit, you get three lessons, right? Two or three lessons. You're working on that in the background, you're watching the lessons. Let me say another thing. I cover all the points I want from the readings in the pre-recorded lessons, but the readings are amazing. So I do want you to have time to read them. So, you know, the kind of stuff we read, I always have a book avalanche here, you know, uh, for example, this fantastic book on being stuck by Lorraine Herring. We are reading a couple of chapters from this. Uh, this fantastic, the best book I know about writer's block by the psychologist, Victoria Nelson on writer's block, um, you know, reading, if you really are struggling with writer's block, reading the, I think I'm giving you like two or three chapters of this um, in PDF for free. Fantastic. When we get to style, for example, John uh, McPhee on the writing process, it's called draft number four, is one of the best resources. And this guy won a Pulitzer, he's um, not, so I'm bringing stuff from academia, from journalism, from writing and creativity, right? So a fantastic um hack for structure. He really opens your mind to new directions on how to approach structuring your work. What else? The Art of Slow Writing, uh, this fantastic book uh, by Louise de Salvo, uh, one of my favorite. Um, Around the Writer's Block from Roseanne Bain. This is the brain science and psychology of writer's block and really practical solutions. Again, you get, you don't have to read all these books because I read them all for you. You get PDFs, 
Yeah, I see you guys are getting the picture. Let me share a couple more that I love. Uh, writing for story, also for the style part. It's the other John, John Franklin, another Pulitzer Prize winner. These are really fantastic books. So I basically huddled together a syllabus because I'm an academic. Um, and I know you guys love a syllabus. And so you also get just the reading list and everything ready for you to enjoy. And I'll tell you something. If you are really stressed this summer and need to get to the writing, um, I see people jumping in and really just zooming in on the pre-recorded lessons. I can kind of see later because I see when people download things, people go back to these readings. This is a lifelong, you get forever access to this beautiful symbols. And I see Susan, like, right? So Susan Knight, for example, before she did foundational, she did advanced, and sometimes maybe we would do one and one and I'll go, why don't you go back to draft number four, right? I think you should, let's go back, you know, it's time to outline. Uh, this book has a fantastic chapter on outlining. Let's do that, right? So it's a foundation. This is why I call it foundational workshop. So yeah, you can take the standalones. You can take the full thing. I, of course, recommend taking the whole thing, but I really like the schedule for summer that says you work on your unit and then we have this big day long um, impactful because I think it could be very impactful to actually have a long day. All right, and then... I hope not to do each of them twice. I hope everybody could do Fridays, but I know maybe not. So I'll just say as a caveat that um, we always do voting on the group and we also have to accommodate for time zones. I, I, I love having an online business. I sometimes have people from Hong Kong, Australia, the Netherlands, Sweden, and of course, all across the United States. Um, so sometimes it takes a little bit of flexibility, um, but we always figure it out. All right, so back to the PowerPoint. Now, of course, if you have questions, write, feel free to, um, I, I really want to let you ask now, but then again, I, I don't want to waste too much time for the people who are not here to learn about the workshop and they want the free freebies. So let's go do that. And then you can write them in the chat. All right. So today let's unblock your motivation, um, taking time to contemplate the why and the how of this idea that, oh, I'm just not motivated. So let me tell, start with telling you what my clients and students say. This is, these are from my intake questionnaires. I just randomly picked up two. And I don't ask about motivation. I just ask, what are your challenges? And I can tell you, like, I don't think there's ever been a client that didn't start with something like, I'm okay once I begin, but I find it hardest to get motivated. My coach here goes like, mm, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> That's anxiety, right? If it's it's almost like anxiety is this wall and you try to hurl yourself over the wall to get to your project. Um, I like to build a little door in the wall so that you can just walk right in. Or maybe you can just, I don't know, build a ditch under. But I really don't want to pretend like that anxiety wall can go away all at once. I really like to invite you to think creatively about ways to, you know, what do you do with the wall? All right, another one that I really love from a student, a client. I like writing in theory, but for some reason, it's often so hard to feel excited and motivated. So I procrastinate, delay, and endlessly avoid my writing until the very last minute. At the end, I kill myself to meet the deadline, which doesn't help my motivation to engage in writing the next time. I love this quote because it really shows you the cycle, right? You feel unmotivated, you don't start, it creates the lag, you procrastinate. Um, and let me say another thing real quick. It's impatient. This It comes from a place of lack of patience with yourself. Now, again, I'm jumping a little bit into unit one because you can't really start without understanding that. So let me just say to you, the part of us that is the creative part in our psyche. That's a young part. That's like your seven-year-old inner child, all right? Now, imagine your seven-year-old coming back, or, you know, a seven-year-old that you know, coming from home from school, super anxious about math homework. Like, ah! Very, very anxious. Imagine you then going ahead and saying, well, you're a loser because you're not motivated. Why don't you just sit your ass down and do it? I mean, we cringe, right? Because we would never talk to a child like that. 
right? I mean, if you're here and you're going to talk to a child like that, please leave. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, but this is what we do to ourselves, right? I mean, I would sit here fullness tools and kind of just monitor the kind of thoughts that come up in my head, like the horrible voices. It was just, oh my God, we're so mean, right? It's like, you're lazy, you're no good. Oh yeah, you, you did this and you won an award, but that was like nothing. Now you're like, look now that you really need to do this, right? Like horrible, horrible messages. Um, your inner child, when you talk to your inner child like that, that child just doesn't want to come out and play. It's punishing you because you're mean. It's like hiding in a tree house, throwing rocks at you from up there and saying, leave me alone. All right. So I like to invoke a lot of visual um, metaphors because very much research, and a lot of you are doing that kind of research, you know that that taps parts of your brains, uh, parts of your brain that are uh, the, the unconscious part, right? Like the, the, the fountain, the well, as you call it, right? All of those images and archetypes, it's very much manipulating you on purpose to start digging under that wall, reconnect with that part of you, that inner child part to drive. And you'll see that you have to make some amends, right? There's a process where you have to kind of re-nurture that. But the beautiful thing about that relationship is that now that you're grown up, you can reparent that child. You can be that person. So you can bring few, like some of the exercises that I do is to write a letter using the wisdom of your future self um, to write to your current self or using your current self to talk to your child self. So you can see the kind of interventions. And again, this is a lot of what we do in the first unit. All right, so you guys are getting the picture. So here is the, the conundrum. Now let's move on to learn a little bit about motivation. So I really love this book by Daniel H. Pink uh, called Drive, which, in which he's basically given a really good summary of all that science I talked to you about. Uh, it's called The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. Um, and I mean, again, I kind of quickly explain it. Now, this guy has an amazing TED Talk. So if you want a little bit more from him and you don't want to read the book, uh, check his TED Talk about motivation. It's hilarious. It's really a perfectly delivered TED Talk, very funny uh, and informative. All right, so this is quickly the basics of his argument. So what we tend to think of when we say motivation is this reward punishment drive, right? Like I will motivate myself by giving myself a reward or I will, you know, I can't go to the movies with my family for family night if I didn't finish my writing or you know and then you there's the added shame from like I'm not showing up for the family or whatever right it's like I see a lot of people like oh all of this sounds familiar right um this kind of reward or punishment it comes from the outside even if you're implementing it right it's this external motivation it also is very much aligned with what we like to call in the woo world like ego thinking right it's like Everything I do has to prove my worth to the world, right? Your writing is not there for you to joyfully contribute your perspective to the world. I mean, that's great if you're there, but then you'll probably not be looking at taking a creative and blocking class, right? It's like the paralysis of this is the head of the path because this, there's this outside. I have to prove myself to somebody. And if I don't prove myself, I'm going to fail. And it's going to end up having all these I better discipline myself. Ah! Now, if you're already exhausted after a year of teaching and God knows what else you had to deal with this year in academia, where is the energy to discipline yourself with reward and punishment? I will tell you, you have a exactly zero amount of energy. You're trying to tap a dry well. So this doesn't work. All right. So the carrot and stick, if then model, right, doesn't work. All right. If you guys want to take a picture of this before... Um, um, you know, I know, uh, I know that I'm, I'm going through this fast, right? So this is what we tend to think about when we say, I am not motivated. It's like, I cannot discipline myself through being a really mean motherfucker. <laughs> Excuse my French, right? I like to provoke, right? I cannot make myself by being mean to myself, do the thing. Now at this point, right in time, I stop and ask people, Hey, you didn't go into business. You're not making a million dollars writing your journal article this summer. 
right? Let's try to just, this is like, what is going on? What did you do that you deserve so much discipline and punish? Didn't you reach for call, <laughs> right? What did you do that you deserve so much ire, your self-loathing, self-hate, lack of trust? So really where I kind of intervene is to, to restore your trust in yourself, which allows you to have enough self-compassion to really intervene. In the, in, and all of this is very unconscious, right? It's, it's under the surface. We don't know. All we know is we can bring ourselves to our desk to start working. The reasons are kind of, because it's unconscious, right? Are, are, they're not known to us. So we really need to understand, you know, our fight or flight mechanism is already triggered by years of this. You hate going to your desk to write because you've been doing this to yourself for years. And your inner child is like, here she goes again. She's going to be mean to me. Off to the tree I go. La, 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 la. Right? And so you want to bring the child down from the tree by like, I don't know, offering treats and making it all fun. And I know it sounds counterintuitive, like, I ain't fun. I now have to prove myself by doing this journal article. But really, you know, it's one of those, you have to slow down before you get smooth and then you can go fast. So to really create momentum, you have to kind of agree to stop, drop, and roll, which is what we say to American children um, when, right, we're training them uh, about fire hazard, right? So I love that one also, like, stop, drop, and roll, because you're not even noticing you're on fire. This is what I'm trying to say. You have to stop, go like, oh shit, I'm on fire. All right, and then, okay, what do I do? Drop and roll. So it's counterintuitive, but that's the program. I, basically, I thought of renaming my program to stop, drop, and roll. All right, friends. So we're making some progress. All right, so how do we motivate creativity? And by the way, obviously, to me, whatever research you're writing, this is a creative pursuit. And this is part of the problem also. I think like that we pretend in academia like we're making furniture, we're building, like, or, you know, um, cooking lasagna, let's put all the layers. But, you know, so many times I'm gonna actually stop and say this because this is important. So uh, my pet peeve is how horrible all of my advice, well, not all of my advisors, but a lot of my advisors during the year, I have a really good PhD advisor and I don't wanna, Shanti Kumar is awesome, so please, this is not about him, this is not about you, Shanti, but a lot of people throughout the, you know, the people who just would tell me things like, just do it, just go, go do it, do, do it, do it. This is lazy advice. This is the person who himself is stuck and does not know how they do what they do and all they can offer is just like, go away from my office hours, stop wasting my time and just go do it. The just go do it advice is, I think the reason why so many of us carry so much shame because our professors, instead of training us on developing a writing process, pretended like we somehow should already know how to do all of that. All right, you guys are getting it. I see nods, I almost see tears. <laughs> okay, so how do we motivate creativity? Uh, okay, this goes back to that, right? So for decades, motivation research in fields from economy to neuroscience and all the way in between demonstrates that if then reward punishment are useful only for mechanical tasks, right? Stuff in envelope, I said already, and that intrinsic motivation works best for incentivizing creative tasks. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about, okay, hang on, if you want to take a picture of this. Uh, or a screenshot, uh, I can make the PowerPoint available on the group later, so so we can move on. Okay. So intrinsic motivation works best to save, save. So let's talk about creative tasks. What do they involve? They involve out of the box thinking, pattern disruption. When you are writing a new piece of research, you are trying to intervene in everything that came before you and disrupt that pattern. Even if it's just right, all of these people said that, but they didn't look at this, right? My gap. All of these other people from this other side of the literature, they looked at this, but they didn't do that. And what I am trying to do is disrupt the pattern by bringing together all the work that came before me in a new, interesting way that shows what I have to offer that is new, right? Correct, that's the convention of academic writing. This is very, uh, um, very creative. So you have to tap your innovative problem solving part of your mind. Uh, it's very, you have to 
also tap your right brain, the non-strategic thinking, not just the part of the brain, left brain. Again, we know that the left brain, right brain is too simplistic, but we're talking about these two kind of like peripheral thinking and very strategic, let's get something executed. Um, we, we need both. We need to be able to absorb a lot of information and then let it kind of sit and sit and until we get the gestalt aha moment, right? And we need to have patience for all of that process. Uh, creative tasks also involve playing, looking in the periphery, what I said right now, getting inspired by irrelevant information, taking a long period of incubation. Uh, I remember going to a conference in New York and cutting a full day of panels to go, I always love to go to the MoMA, and I stumbled upon a, um, I'm a television scholar, right? And I started in the 80s and there was this uh, exhibition about Latin American architecture and modernity between the 50, from like from the 20s to the 80s. And it was the most inspiring thing. I ended up sitting there in the, um, you know, I'll stop, and stop the churches and just, you know, I didn't expect it. They had like um, a video, um, what do you call it? Like exhibit. But they had five screens from, and they showed videos from five different Latin American um, capitals, from Rio de Janeiro to Santiago de Chile, all the way to, I don't remember, but all five. And they were showing modernity. So they were showing hospitals in all of them, uh, airports in all of them. I was thinking about global television formats, about the new kind of venue in the 2010s, right? Uh, type of globalization that was able to kind of go everywhere and get the container, like be a, a global container for local identity. And I was sitting there just being literally kind of presented with, this is not new, <laughs> you know? So I remember sitting there, I, I, I went to kind of escape my scholarship, but in the museum from an unexpected source, I got super inspired. Um, and that kind of led the foundation for what I wrote got me a book contract, in, you know, not to get too much into my story. So back to creativity. We really deprive our creative inner contributor when we only try to apply this kind of like, let me discipline myself. I have to sit there. And then also we have this, you know, silly, misguided idea that we just sit there and we write the last rough verse, right? There is no playing, there's no moving things around. And you know what? I see with my clients, when they actually do what needs to be done, which is the playful stuff to incubate, they tell themselves, today I didn't work. Today I just went to the museum, for example, I would say, right? So I really am intervening on the level of, why don't you trust your own process? I think a lot of us, if we only gave ourselves the permission to be playful in the beginning, to allow the chaotic, all of that, then we would actually see that we already know what needs to happen. All right, so back to the motivation thing. So Daniel Pink basically is bottom line. He says your 21st century work task likely require creative, not mechanical skills. Um, there's also like this famous um, uh, experiment that was uh, redone a million times and the results are very stable. Uh, I can tell you, actually, I can recommend if you want to watch, uh, there's a reality show on Netflix that actually, re we, that has Daniel Pink on it. It's called 100 Humans and they recreated that experiment. So just go watch it. But I can tell you right quick, basically they took, there's 100 humans, they divide them into two groups of 50 each and they give them um, a project. The, the, and, and each 50, each group of 50 uh, also breaks down to groups of five. And the project is a creative project. They get pretzels and marshmallows and they have to erect the, the, the tallest structure. Now, in the discipline motivation side, they tell them the group that's going to have the, the tallest structure is going to get a thousand or two thousand dollars, like a nice reward, right? And in the other group, they say, just enjoy yourself. Everybody just, you know, enjoy yourself. I mean, you guys can already imagine the result. The group that was competitive, first of all, just the atmosphere that was in the room. People um, were mean to each other. Somebody, every in every group, somebody tried to be the alpha and dominate everybody else. 
Uh, the other group was very collaborative. All the different groups like had patience to ask each other the best ideas. And, you know, at the end, the group that was competitive, even their tallest, the, the group that won, their structure was lower, like not as high as the lowest structure in the playful group, right? So their outcome was were shit. Uh, they had a lot of like, a lot of people really where the whole thing collapsed. It was all tension, competition, horrible, right? So very clear, obvious thing. If it's a creative thing, you want to have. So the other group where everybody was just told, just enjoy all, even the, the you know, the, the lowest of structures was the higher than the competitive group. And then everybody had a really good time accomplishing the task. Now, here is my provocation to you. I'm kind of jumping ahead of time. Think about your academic environment. Think about your university, right? Or, you know, if you're not currently in university or, you know, your graduate program, or if you go to conferences, right? What kind of model of incentivization are we most subjected to in academia? I mean, I can tell you my horror stories, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave this. We're gonna workshop this in a, in a minute. So, but that's, that's where I'm taking this, right? I mean, we all know that it's not the playful one. All right. So the foundation of intrinsic motivation, according to Daniel Pink, are three elements. Autonomy. You all have the urge to direct your own life. We have the urge to direct our own lives. If you are trying to motivate intrinsically, if you, it's, it's, let me rephrase, I misspoke. You, your only job here is to align with your already existing motivation, right? Then you don't even have to worry about motivating myself. The paradigm shift that I offer is how can you align with the motivation that you already have? You have a motivation. Your motivation is to make your contribution. Uh, you know, you, you are the only one with your eyes to see the world. You've done all the years of research you've done. I'm sure, you know, in this call, if we tally all the years and experience of research that people bring to the table here, you know, you guys are amazing fonts of innovation and, and, and thinking, and it's research-based. So why don't you give yourself the autonomy, right? to believe that you have the urge to direct your own life and make that, you know, put that in the driver's seat of your motivation puzzle, right? The second one is mastery. We all have the desire to get better at something that matters to us, right? And the third one is purpose. The yearning to do what we do in the service of something bigger than ourselves. So with these three purpose, purpose, uh, mastery and autonomy, these are the three foundations of intrinsic motivation. And again, what I am inviting you guys to do is to unlearn this idea that you're lazy and you're not motivated and you're useless and you're a procrastinator and blah, 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 blah. And just say years of <laughs> bad habits, toxic habits around my writing um, led me to burnout and to have a lot of anxiety surrounding my writing. And I actually put my hands on my chest for a reason when I do that, because this is actually the, uh, the practice. It's a, a kind of a meditation, right? So you hold your heart and you just say, I'm anxious. I am not aligned with my intrinsic motivation. And I wanna make a gentle commitment to realign, not with discipline, but with this intrinsic motivation. So that's that's a provocation I have for you. This is the invitation. All right. All right. So then let's see what else. Let's recap. Neither, neither or neither, neither threats or no rewards, right? So not the sticks nor the carrots, uh, neither compensa compensation, recognition, or external validation, but also not like tenure denials, uh, more teaching when you don't publish, all those punishments, right, are not going to help you incentivize creative tasks. So this is the word to write. So now let's think about the academic environment and especially the way academic writing is wired into our institutions, incentivization schemes, right? Sorry, this is, I didn't prefer this. <laughs> I like making mistakes because I don't role model perfectionism. I get to do that um, now that I've left academia, right? So this is the invitation. Let's workshop. 
Um, so we can do one or two things, you guys. We can, I'm going to go get back to this, but if you are ready to open openly, just talk about it, or we can take a minute or two for you to kind of write a little bit of a response to that. Uh, if that uh, feels good. Usually in workshops, what we would do is we would take, if it was like a paid full workshop, we would take like 30 minutes or 15 minutes and let people really uh, journal. Uh, I recommend uh, blank pages for journaling. Uh, this is also, there's research that shows that, it, you know, the, the, the blank page doesn't have even the rules. It's it's allowing you to tap the most creative parts of your brain. Um, but yeah, we can do a minute or two, but honestly, I would rather just hear from you if you wanted, uh, and those of you who are in attendance, to share uh, a little bit about your thoughts about that, right? So how does your academic environment incentivize it or does not uh, incentivize you? Uh, oh, that's it. All right, friends. So do you want to, okay, do you want to take a, a minute or are people ready to share? Ready? I'm going to look at the chat to see if people are sharing thoughts. Where is the chat? Oh, okay. Some people are, are making lunch and turning off the camera. That's okay. So yeah, feel free to, I mean, I can, I can, let, let me share with you my, I'll start with sharing my horror stories. I remember, and I think I've shared this in, in previous videos before. I remember when I was a tenor track assistant professor, right? With two kids, uh, two babies, you know, just like always up. I remember that I developed an anxiety attack that was like every single year when we would have the beginning of the year, like before the year begins, we would have the big faculty meeting. And every single time, this is how it would go. Uh, the administrator, and we had many different administrators come and go, would come in with a message from the higher echelon of the university that basically could be distilled to, you people are shit. <laughs> You're not doing enough. You don't have enough publications. You don't have enough grant monies. You don't have enough students uh, graduating. It's never enough. And it always came with a, 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 a little side dish of promised punishment. And I remember people actually saying in my department that the problem with our university is that it's all sticks and no carrots, right? And the punishments were like, you will get more teaching you will be made to teach more, which like also like we are teaching, you know, in, you could be a research and teaching institution, but like, why are we approaching teaching classes as a punishment? This is our profession. Okay, so that's a problem in and of itself, right? And okay, that has to do with how we teach in academia, but that's a whole other thing, right? So it was, uh, or you're gonna lose, we're not gonna give you as much travel money. We're not, just punishments all. But when I read Daniel Pink, I remember going like, Oh my goodness, it's not, the problem is not just that it's all sticks and no carrots. Even if they offer the occasional carrot, you know, sometimes you could apply for a grant internally. If you wrote a thing, they would give you some money or they would, you know, uh, uh, take away one of your classes. The problem is not too much sticks and no carrots. The problem is sticks and carrots. Sticks and carrots are the wrong way to incentivize somebody that is already wanting to make a creative contribution. So here is, again, my intervention. You are placed in, in an environment, oh, and good, somebody's right here, right? So you're placed in an environment that's like stifling that inner creativity. Yes, so go ahead. I'm uh, So Noel, I'm not sure it's RR Noel, so I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, sorry. It's Rebecca and I go by Becky. Um, and that was me saying I was going to turn off my camera to make lunch, but that was actually a little bit ago and I made lunch and I ate it and I'm great. Um, okay, all right. So yeah, please share. Um, so I'm in a very different kind of institution. I'm at a teaching forward institution. I have been trying to write the same book for 150 years. You're stuck. No. Oh, okay. So Becky just started. Oh, Becky, you were stuck for me. You, we, we last oh, started writing for 150 years trying to finish yeah. the same book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'm a full professor and haven't finished it. I have some articles and you know various other things. Oh yeah, yeah. Stuck again. Wonder what can be done to make this. All right, Becky. So I'm. Uh, 
I'm going to guess Becky's trying to reconnect. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're back now. Yeah, okay. I, as far as I could see, I never went away. Um, my point is I, I, I need to finish it for intrinsic reasons. I don't need to finish it for, for professional reasons. I need to finish it because of my like emotional arc that I'm trying to. Right. So we're stuck on emotional arc that you're trying. But I, I feel like I get, I, I get what you're trying to say. Uh, yeah, the zoo is uh, freeze. It's right. Yeah, the zoo. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So it's emotional, intrinsic. So, and then what happens? So for me, it's a lot about uh, just finding time, you know, man managing the all the stuff. I'm like a department chair and kind of a sub dean and junk like that. That's a lot. So I'm hearing and you, you're frozen again, but this is the perfect timing because I hope you can hear me while you're frozen. It sounds to me like the classical, right? You have so many different things. Are you hearing me while you're stuck? Yeah, hopefully. Right. Yeah. Good. You can hear me. So, yes. Yeah, so I, I would definitely recommend, you know, like the, the scheduling part, because I mean, this is so when you have so many administrative and, you know, we didn't even go into like, you know, your people in your life that need you and, you know, you're taking care of people and things. Um, I, I'm going to venture a guess that when you cannot find the time, you tend to blame yourself instead of saying, well, this is, you know, this is just what is the situation, right? This is, you know, so I would work, my intervention for you would be like, so first of all, yay, fantastic that you already know, no, I want to write this book because I want to write this book and I've been wanting to, and I'm getting the sense that it's been forever and you've been trying to get to it and you can get to it. So yeah, yeah. I, I, and I'm very familiar. So I'll, I'll just tell you immediately that the, the odds are in your favor because I think as long as you know in the driver's seat you have this like I actually want to do it then we can clear the clutter the anxiety introduce some good you know get rid of some bad mindset anxious self-critical um patterns um that you are carrying around your writing and kind of just like start afresh and can and and build um with again, with those gentle tools that start kind of intervening with your, what I call your time bins. So as much as, you know, I I would love to have you on board for the full program, but I certainly think you need, you know, the unit about time, like time and then style and then craft would, would really like, so, you know, I, again, I believe in that full thing, but like two, uh, two through four would be fantastic for you because we really just intervene with, we start with, um, Kind of tool. My basic tool around timing and planning is meant to burst your delusion, right? Because we actually have you say, okay, this is what my week is going to be. And you start by blocking out everything that's, um, I, I will look for the one that I have for me. Everything that's, here it is. This is my summer, <laughs> as you can see. So I started by blocking out the vacation, the week that's the vacation with my kids. Right. And then look now I don't teach, but like usually now, but you know, I would I would block out meetings and teachings and I would really try to also kind of use that um, over time to say, well, if between four and eight, this is my time with my kids. Can this also be the time that I fold the laundry? So I'm not folding it Monday between eight and four, which is the time that I recognize is the time I'm writing. Right? And then we also introduce tools to help you be okay with what happens during the time you set us out for writing, if it needs to be more playful. Sometimes I send people to go take a nap or go get inspired or read a novel or whatever it is, right? So we first identify what your time commitments really are. And then we can kind of, now here's how this works. People start, like you gotta practice several weeks because you start to say, okay, this is what I have. And then you're like, you always overthink like I can do five sessions of three hours each week. And then, you know, you always see that, ah, in fact, no, I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. So it's not meant to control. You're not supposed to be see that this is where I will have time and then I'm going to sit there and make myself. No, it's a curiosity kind of tool that allows you to then go back at the end of the week and go like, whoa, what happened? So what I actually encourage people to do is to then every day say what actually did happen, right? So the plan was this, 
whatever I actually need. And I actually start seeing gains with people when they are allowing themselves themselves to actually grab the minimal amount of time, like to really understand, well, you know what, I have an hour a day and that's what I have and that's okay. So then it's it's not so much a let's control time to, it's more like, let's be curious. <laughs> what is um, happening with my time? John uh, Didion said, um, oh no, no, sorry, it was Annie Dillard, the, the RBI, she said, the, uh, our days are like gods. Our lives are lived day by day, right? So really, I I love that. It's like every day you want to honor the day. Part of the way I work with people about time is to also not get angry with yourself about your commitments. If they are uh, negotiable, we will have a conversation and start negotiating, right? But this is the foundation. You got to first see what really is going on before you can start creating, you know, those those um, writing times. And then you gotta be comfortable about the process uh, that you have, right? And then, so Susan can tell you again, I can look at her because I know we've worked on all this. A really one huge thing that, and maybe because of that, Becky, I will say, again, unit one is important because you differentiate between two types of work sessions that are both important. And one is called process time, and the other one is called product time. Uh, and this is from this fantastic book, the Around the Writer's Block. And, you know, she has this system of schedule for 15 minutes of each. I don't, yeah, you can do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan of like, this is, you know, you know, follow this in this way. But I love to take kind of step back and take the tools and say, okay, there is product time, which is everything that, you know, drafting, revising everything like that, right? But there's also process time and you gotta allow yourself to the process. And then you gotta be curious about what is your process because, and this is another, I think this is from Julia Cameron, another favorite quote, writing has a plan. It will show you if you are attentive, if you listen. And we all know that, that, you know, so many times we actually are doing the next thing that needs to happen, but our mind is judging it as not this. Right. So maybe you do need to, you know, your inner intuition knows you might need to go to the museum to get inspired today. I teach people to count that as writing. So we really start retraining with acceptance, you know, that we are able to actually name, yeah, these are the things that I'm doing when I'm writing and it's not just this. So this is the program. All right. So then, you know, but I will say I, I hear you, but I've seen so many, so many people. You know, I'm waiting and it's kind of like getting to where like now I really want to do it already. And I've been waiting all these years and there's always something. But I must also tell you, Becky, that there is a, um, highly likely a level of, of sabotage going, like self-sabotage going in there where we get so busy, right? In the first place. And I see you're going like, yeah, right? So, you know, I'm busy, busy, busy. I'm so busy that I can't, you know, be busy with what I want to be busy <laughs> is uh, a known kind of self-sabotage. And probably it's a mix of these things because you get anxious when, and, and I'll tell you another thing, pet projects, a lot of the time, like you said, I was able to get all these articles out. Maybe you were like more willing to compromise on, again, perceived quality, although by the end of it, it's, it's a good quality, but you're like, okay, that's just an article. But this project is important. But this, again, remember the Jack, like you're propping up the importance of it. And this engages the ego. And the ego is a sneaky bastard, right? So the ego would always find a way to tell you, oh, you're not going to prove your worth by doing this, right? So, be, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example because I know a lot of people that uh, are like that. You finally get through the anxious wall and you start writing and suddenly it starts coming good and there's a couple of good sentences and then a voice in your head goes, ooh, this is good stuff. This is important work. And then the next thing goes, and it's a, it's quick as a, as a lightning. Ooh, it's, I'm going to get invited. I'm going to be big in the world now because I'm doing this important work. What happens next? Boom. The wall is up again. You're out of it. What happened? You went into flow state. You got through the anxiety. And then your ego intervenes by judging even when it judges that it's good. Remember, it's not just not sticks, no carrots. Even when it just, it's the judgment itself. So I, itself. so I learned to just say, oh, hi, ego. I, you're not in the driver's seat. Please go back to the back of the car. I don't want to hear about the quality of the work right now. I'm just trying to get it out. 
just trying to get it out, right? So this is the kind of retraining we do. And here's another thing I want to say to everybody that's interested in doing this work. The only way to decondition a pattern is to repeat the pattern and catch yourself, right? So it takes a little bit of patience. It's repeating, again, I love the ancient I Ching. So this is 3,000 year old wisdom. And it says, if you repeat the pattern or, or you repeat the cycle, but this time with awareness, then you're making progress. So that's the invitation is to come in, you engage with mindfulness uh, in, in practices that you've done all your life without thinking. And then you catch yourself and you bring it to workshop and you say, oh, this week, I, oh my God, I was doing this thing or that thing. Or, you know, you, people bring connections from something they've read in the readings and something they heard in the lecture. Together as a group, we really start kind of turning the corner on the practice. And I want to say another thing, <clears throat> excuse me, right? So there's the level of becoming mindful, but then there's the level of introducing new habits. And that takes some time and it takes repetition. So you really need to commit to, um, and again, it's not one of those like commit now or you'll never, you relapse and you recommit and you relapse and you recommit, but you, you know, the, the idea that it's kind of like, um, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and you're done. Um, and, you know, a lot of those coaching programs that are being sold to academics, like, come to me and I will do the magic trick and I will tell you exactly how to layer the lasagna and you will have your product. And I think that's a big old fat lie. I invite people to cut the mistakes together. Let's all repeat the mistake patterns and catch ourselves doing it and see how we do this to ourselves and where the self-sabotage lies. And slowly and surely, I see people kind of unfurl, books get finished, articles, or abandoned. By the way, that's also an important outcome that I have with a lot of clients to come in and abandon a book. Um, <clears throat> but um, just from how you were talking, Becky, about your book, I feel like yours is not one to abandon, it's one to, to actually like a passion project to finish. Maybe you will discover you want to restructure it or do something else with it. And that's another thing, I mean, something has been delayed for so long, there is some scar tissue and scubs <laughs> kind of around it where it's like, ah, and you're almost afraid to open, right? But you want to actually, you know, again, I'm very visual and I intend to shock, right? Like you want to maybe like re-trigger the wound to kind of let, again, like now I'm going into pus, so it's disgusting, but that's the idea. If something was festering, we want it out and then cleaned and then patched up and through practice slowly but surely, get into and then you know here is my other again this is the pitch right and a warning when you heal your relationship with your inner creative part there is no telling what new things come out of it right so you really are recreating your writing life but writing has a way to recreate your life life your entire life so you know to be honest i you know never imagined i would leave academia working with my academic writer's block first for myself and my students, all right? I had six, I made six PhDs, made baby vamps, right? Like make them into <laughs> doctors. Um, I was really developing all of these practices as a blocked academic writer myself, trying to figure out why is it so hard and help my students. Um, but honestly, I kind of freed, I think my writing built a tunnel underneath my old life. Uh, and, you know, when I got out of the other side, here I am living... <laughs> I was like, I never imagined that I would want to not be in academia, write research, teach, right? So basically, I ended up with my own university that I created, uh, where I'm the registrar, the president, and in charge of incentivizing in a correct way. All right, so you get the point. But that's that's the um, that's what we do. Anybody else wants to share? Susan, are you ready to share a little bit with us? Um, Maddie, I know that. Uh, uh, we talked last year, uh, or was it two years ago already that you went to Harvard? Um, and there's a lot going on. So yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I I'm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I, I'll be able to join the group, but I, I appreciate everything you're doing, but I'm a single mom with two small children, right? And now I'm also, um, we're not right. We can talk, I can talk to you about money. I'm not trying to sell you the workshop. I'm, I'm trying yeah, to Yeah, I just, I guess my, my issues are, you know, really like, yeah, I've 
made my schedule. I have very limited time to chip away and I'm, I'm chipping away and that's all I can really hope for, I guess, you know, um, uh, you know, like yeah. life is the way it is. I have two small kids. I'm in the sandwich yeah. generation. Do I want to be, it's a very thin sandwich since I'm a, you know, the only person there. So that's, that's life, you know? Um, Absolutely. and one of the things I've, I've learned about myself in the last year is, you know, that I have ADHD too. And which is, which is, which is good to know, Absolutely. but, um, you know, some of the stuff you said about carrots and sticks, yeah, you don't want to do stuff just for a dopamine hit, but you know, when you do have ADHD, like you have to do it for a dopamine hit in a way, right? Yeah. Because well, otherwise well, you're not going to yes, get anything thanks. done. Right. And some and well, of the yeah, techniques that are point. out there for normal writers, you know, they're not really helpful for me because yeah, you know, so, um, let, I mean, I really enjoy, I think I would enjoy most is having a community to write with, but I don't know. If I, can hang on, I actually to want to respond so I, to your community. Just a second. I do want to hear more from you, but I want to respond because this, you're bringing up a really important point. We're not getting read completely of stuff that works for you in your life. And by the way, I am raising, I have this, I'm raising a, ch a child with ADHD. I have this smart but scattered. It's a really good, this was recommended by the child therapist. Um, so absolutely, at the end of the day, you know, you know what works best for you and small rewards, like that's a totally different, like I'm not against whatever tools that work. It's the paradigm in itself, right? Like if all the incentivization is, you'll be punished or you'll, or you'll be rewarded, right? So I, I just want to kind of comment about, about what you said. There are really useful tools when you, when you at a certain stage of writing, when you're at the stage where you're generating writing, which is just a stage. It's one of many stages of the process. Um, I absolutely adore small, like, you know, like um, uh, reward, like little, Kind of behavioral almost hits, like you said, like like Pavlovian hits can really serve your process. So that's just an important thing, uh, addition, uh, and that is whether or not you have ADHD. Um, we can absolutely harness, but think about what Daniel Pink explained, right? When you've narrowed down your writing challenge to um, easy to follow series of tasks. Right, because now you know what your paragraphs are and you need to just create them. But that's a stage. What I'm intervening in is the, the before, right? So every different stage of the writing process requires mindful kind of tweaking of what, and again, I'm not, Maddie, I'm not like, no, I'm trying to convince you to join the workshop. Like if you can join this summer, great. If not, we'll be sad, but- I know, I know. I appreciate everything you're doing. I'm just, I'm just, really, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, no, I really, so here's the thing. I love the, that pushback because yes, at a certain stage for a certain type of person, not for everybody, right? It can really be great to uh, include little incentives. And again, when you went through the confusion and the chaos at the beginning and you have, right? And maybe even you've created a first messy draft and you've talked with someone and you show them and you know, you're getting towards those, the, the stages where you actually are layering the lasagna. This is a very late stage in the writing process. This is what we don't kind of get as academic writers that this is the process of completing a project. It's not necessarily how beginning a project happens, right? Then absolutely, I'm 100% I'm with you. For many people, small kind of um, rewards and incentivizations, but again, only when you've moved it, you move the needle from the very, very creative beginning of the task to, no, okay, now it's a bunch of stuff you, you need to do and you know what it is. You feel very clear. You know what each section, each paragraph, right? And then you reward yourself for that. I'm not against that at all. So thank you for letting me clarify that, right? I'm intervening on a meta level saying, if you come in and your university tells you, you know, I'm going to punish you if you publish or reward, you know, uh, if you don't and, and reward you if you do, it leaves you without that connection to tap that inner motivation. But I also think that you're highly, I happen to know you, Maddie, and think that you're a highly motivated person. But all of us are. This is what I'm trying to say. We are, and then we are being introduced with these belittling, toxic models of incentivization that actually take away our agency from the process and our power. Yeah. 
Uh, Susan, yeah, I see you want to jump in. Yeah. Uh, unmute yourself. You are muted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I will say, I mean, I have benefited immensely from Sharon's workshops in the past. Um, I'm sure if I'm at a place, well, in fact, I know I'm not really at a place to do a full workshop since I'm trying to finish the results of previous workshops, although I will say I like um, the idea of special units, and um, we can talk privately about th something of that that I'd like to consider. But um, I also, um, I wanted, if I mean, if you're interested to offer a little something back, because, um, well, as you and I know, um, world events in the last several months hit really close to home and personal, and that did have a um, deleterious effect on um, our writing practices and other things. So I'm Absolutely. so glad to see you back, just as I'm feeling better to be back. Um, one thing I worked on that was relatively low resolution during those early months was um, an essay about motivation, and we discussed this in earlier or, um workshops about my unlikely source of um, inspiration, which is um, the musical theater work of Jonathan Larson, the author of Rent, and nice. focusing on his other somewhat less well-known but wor very worthy musical Tick, Tick, Boom, about, I mean, when you're feeling pressure to um, complete something. You feel like you've got only so much time to do it to accomplish something great. That was kind of um, the, tag, the tagline. And um, how do you move beyond that? And I kind of explore that through the music school. So um, it's part of a whole volume now, the Independent Scholars Guide, but I think it can also be useful for academics. So I would be more than happy to share it. It's free and open access. Yeah, and you guys should also, you know, Susan also offers uh, developmental editing services uh, by her own merit. So I'm gonna, you know, help help, uh, you know, with a shout out for that. Uh, Susan, just real quickly, I see that people are saying that they have to go and they have to leave this. So we're we're gonna start kind of wrapping up. There's what if anybody's here that still wants to ask a question or uh, share something, I would be happy to do that. I did want to. Uh, quickly just show you uh we did we did all of this hang on um i think i hang on let me see here you go um i just want to quickly show the uh, are you guys seeing the 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 now the workshop landing page uh susan let me know if you're seeing this yeah okay good all right so i did want to just show you so I am still the 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 shopping cart is open for the full thing that and now with the uh, early bird special you can get the full thing for seven hundred eighty five. Um, this is basically uh, the landing page. It has the program description, all four units, um, what's included in all the unit. It shows you all the pre-recorded lessons and the schedule, right? So June fourteenth live workshop, June twentieth. So you can you can. Uh, let me actually, I will share this in the chat as well and on the Facebook, um, but you can see, then you can go and you, if you want to enroll, and again, as you see, I think I've limited it to two um, early bird special rates, so you want to grab this quickly because it's going to go away, and this is if you know you're going to do the full thing. Now, I'm still working with my team in the background. It's a little bit harder to set up the everyone, uh, every unit is 250 but the early bird is 235, but then you can add as a discount, at a discount as you check out, you, if you're buying unit one and you know you want unit four, you would be able to just add when you check out the additional, right? So you can take any of these combination. You can take one and two or two and three or three and one, or whichever one you should be able to kind of just add when you check out the other ones. Uh, now, again, I always wanna, highlight uh as we as classes feel and when especially with the generosity of like you know fully paid and and funded uh faculty members uh were able to join on the on the full um price i try to turn around and offer this community 
uh, scholarships, deep discounts, additional whatever you need, like barters, like breaking up payments. Um, it takes more of my administrative time and basically my I I admit I'm the business, right? I have I have somebody helping me with the, the tech stuff and the web stuff. Um, but I'm really willing to do that in order to find a way for everybody who wants to feel called to uh, work with you, work with you. And I'll tell you another thing, if you're watching this, um, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are, I will watch this later as well. Um, I can't tell you the number of time I've added somebody on a fellowship on like a deep, deep discount. And these, you know, people finish a book or they finish a dissertation, they finish whatever it is that they were stuck on. They go ahead and they get a fantastic job and then they negotiate writing consultancy as part of their job offer and turn around and come back and do advanced workshop, which is a very expensive um, year long workshop to work with me. So, et cetera, et cetera. So it really, the ethos of giving a, while you receive and receiving while you give pays out in the, in the final run. And so again, um, I really want, if you are watching this and you feel cold, I will not be insulted if you know, you're like, I can only do 150 this summer. No, if everybody can only do that, we might not end up making <laughs> enough to make the workshop work. But I'm optimistic because again, I just kind of came out on the group and say, hey, I'm open to doing this. And I was bombarded by people saying, yes, yes, we want to do it. But not everybody could pay the full ticket price. So I'm just, open to see what happens out of it. I have the freedom and the ability. My kids are at home, they're 13 and 15. It's like, I know it's not gonna be many summers that I just have them at home. I'm perfectly happy just kicking back and you know do, doing my writing. I have another business where people really, and, and I have a lot of one-on-one -on -one session with academic writers who are finishing books this summer and I am their developmental editor. So not like this, like, oh my God, I gotta get this done. I'm offering this, I'm hoping it works. I know it helps people when they join. And now we have like power tools starting, so it's time to finish up. Um, but here you go, I'm gonna put in the chat for those of you who are uh, watching, um, I'm putting the early bird. Uh, I'm gonna put it also on the Facebook. Let me just go ahead and do this right now on the Facebook Live. Um, so that the early, because this is the only part I have ready at this point. I have the early bird rate for the full four thing ready. Um, and I think hopefully earlier than June 7th, but by June 7th is my deadline to get all those partial, you know, that you can, you know, take one and add the third and then also add discounted. So that's the last thing I'm going to say about paid services. When you buy any of those workshops, you, you get a discount the more things you buy. So if say you buy the $250 one workshop and you get to it first, you get it for 235. If you add uh, an additional workshop, right? It keeps getting a bigger discount the more you add. And you also get to add one-on-one -on -one sessions with me, which are really expensive at like 50%. I slash them 50% for people who are in my workshops, right? So then you can, you can do either process training with me or developmental editing with me, which again, basically my two categories, I read your shit, I don't read your shit, <laughs> you know, which I can read an outline, but I'm not reading 35, a, a, a developmental edit, you give me 25 to 50, depending on how much, right? Uh, words and I read them and I, and then we just meet and we get in there. And until you have your aha moment and you're ready to go accomplish what we had together, we're not done. So Susan can tell you, it could be an hour, it could be three hours, but we sit there and we're like, ah, oh, you know, we push and we pull. It's like hiring a compassionate, nice dissertation advisor. <laughs> That's what I try to mo model for, for people. All right, so I think we are getting pretty ready to wrap up for today. Thank you everybody for the interest you're showing. Uh, the, I, I can't tell you how many emails and DMs I got, keep them coming. Uh, I really, you know, again, with a personal note, I was almost ready to step away from my academic side of my business after October 7th. I am a Jewish woman. I'm an Israeli woman. I'm a lifelong peace activist, anti-occupation activist, whatever you want. Suddenly that was just not enough for some people for, you know, I don't want to even get into that. 
I just want to send out a secular prayer because I'm a secular person, but you can join with any of your traditions of prayer for peace. We want peace. We want the end of the bloodshed. We want everybody that's hurt, that's innocent to stop hurting. We want, you know, back to speaking specifically about Israel because this is what this is about. We want our hostages back. We don't want anybody innocent to continue to lose their lives in Gaza. Nobody, no kid, no woman, no civilian should be harmed in the way this has been ongoing for the cynicism of government. So today, as there's a deal on the table, I just want to pray we can bring this thing somehow, just like stop, can we stop and get something in place that's going to give some a little bit more hope for a, a better future. That's all I have to say about that. And again, if you're uncomfortable with my identity, then you know what to do. <laughs> See you in another life, brother. Um, but, you know, hopefully it's not as bad. And honestly, like, I just stepped away because I didn't even want to check. Uh, and I think I did become a little bit hostile in weird ways. So I just hope that maybe the fever would break, especially if, again, I'm willing to almost pray to God that I only live in the universe, whatever. Let us have peace and let us move forward and start here because people are hurting. Um, and that's that's all I can. And I, I my heart goes out to everybody who, that hurts. Um, and there's just so much to go around, really. We don't even need to, um, you know, and there's the, there's the danger to our democracy that's coming with all of these. Just enough. Let us just try to get back on track to normalcy where inclus you know, inclusivity and diversity is celebrated in our community, especially this community that I curated so carefully over so many years of, of just giving and you know, uh, trying to like just bring people together across. You will see, if you wanna go on Academic Radio and Block and look at the 4,000 people, they are from everywhere in the world. And I'm mostly proud of how many people from the Middle East are on that list, and I'm not I, not necessarily Israelis. And if you look at the Israelis, few of them are Jewish. A lot of Muslims, a lot of Christians, a lot of Jews. Really, this community stands for everything I believe in, and I really hope that we can continue going. All right, I've talked about it too much for now. I'm so glad that we we're talking about doing summer 2024 uh, because honestly, I didn't even think that it would be possible. So let's see what happens. I'm here for you guys. And I really am passionate always to help you make your contribution without the belief that you have to suffer for it. All right. This is like, leave that for your religion of choice. <laughs> we don't need to suffer for the contribution to be made. We can make our, in fact, it's the other way around. The more joyful we are, the more we're grounded in our curiosity and in our desire to raise our voice to share with people what we know to make a better world, the easier it becomes and the more momentum we can build and the more self-compassion we can give ourselves to tolerate the chaos and the confusion and you know that it's not happening fast enough and all of that stuff. All right, with that, you guys, you can stay on the Zoom. I'm gonna end the Facebook Live. So thank you everybody on Facebook and YouTube who's watching this later and let me know, contact me if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you so much.